Today we are looking at chapter 23 of the book of Acts. And as we come to the close or towards the end of this book, you will find out a lot of things. The attention has now shifted away from the acts of the Spirit of the Almighty God. It's now shifted into what is going on in the life of Paul the Apostle. In other words, we find Paul the Apostle, Paul the Apostle now being incarcerated. He's now in prison. And his imprisonment started in chapter 21. If you remember chapter 20, he had, he had a lot of revelation that told him, don't go to Jerusalem. And the guy decided to go anyway. When he got to Jerusalem, the Bible makes us to understand that he was in the temple going through the rite of purification. In the process of going through that purification rite, the Bible makes us to understand that there were some Jews from Asia. They came and they accosted him and they were trying to, you know, they were trying to maybe just uh, kind of uh, mob him sort of. It took the intervention of the commander of the barrack at that very close to the temple at that time that delivered Paul from the hands of the mob. And the, the commander had to take Paul into prison bound. Bible said that as they were about to go, Paul demanded, Paul requested that he wanted to speak to the people. And in chapter 22, you see the defense of Paul when he was talking to the, to the apostles, talking to the mob there. He started mounting a defense for his faith. He told them how violent he was, how he believed the things that those people were accusing him of, how he used to persecute the Christian, how he used to go to, you know, go to places and arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem, and how he had the support of the leadership, of the Jewish leadership at that particular point in time. By the time you get to verse number 6 through verse number 12, Paul the Apostle began to tell them about his encounter with the resurrected Christ. He was telling them that, yes, I met Jesus on my way to Damascus. And when I saw the light, I became blind. I was led by the hand into, into Damascus. And in Damascus, there was a particular uh, disciple called Ananias who came, prayed for me, baptized me, and gave me the mission that God Almighty already wanted me to do. This was the testimony that was given. And the Bible makes us to understand that Paul the Apostle went on to tell them that by the time he got his restored his sight and got his commission, he came back to Jerusalem just to let them know that, hey, I know more who it is. This thing that we are all destroying is actually the good thing. Unfortunately, not everybody was so gone ho about the thing that Paul, <laughs> Paul was interested in. They said, what? We have been in this business together. Now you want to go back? No, we have to deal with this guy. So Paul the Apostle Paul had to run away from Jerusalem. It was at that point in his testimony that these people said, no, we are no longer here anymore. Let's lynch this guy and let's kill him. When they started, you know, the mob started all over again. The, 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 the captain of that particular guy, the commander, had to take Paul again, put him in jail. Just to be able to keep Paul safe from the mob. And the Bible tells us that by the time you get to verse number 23, you know, by the time you get to chapter 23, you begin to see that Paul the apostle was now arraigned in front of the, uh, in front of the council. And this council was made of what? Was made of both the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. Was, you know, was arraigned before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin was made of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Some of them believed in the resurrection. Others did not believe in the resurrection. Paul the Apostle being a very smart guy. He understood that there was a group that believed in the, in the, in the, in the resurrection. And those who know. He said, yes, because of the resurrection that these people wanted to kill me. Actually, he was defending himself. But that was true also. But he played it very well. Anyway. As soon as they got that, some people supported him, say, oh, this guy doesn't have to die. And some people say, no, they have to kill this guy. So he turned the council upside down. They were arguing between themselves that they were about to tear Paul apart. The commander again had to come, Paul, Paul, pull Paul out of their midst, and kind of, you know, put him back in prison. I want to pick up the story there from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 23, reading from verse number 10. Acts of the Apostles, 23, reading from verse number 10. Now, there arose a great dissension. The commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barrack. Verse number 11. But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have, so, have, have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you, also, so, must also, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they have killed Paul. I wonder where they are going to get the strength if they don't eat and drink. But that's a story for another day. Verse number 13. And there were more than 40 who had, who had formed this conspiracy. When they came to the chief priests and elders, they said, We have bound ourselves under a, a great oath that we, will that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now you, now you therefore, 
together with the council, suggest to the commander that he be brought down to you tomorrow, as though you were going to make a, a further inquiries concerning him. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. May Lord bless the reading of his words in Jesus' name. We are going to go further, but that's just where I want to stop right now. Now, from this verse of the scripture, I want you to see certain things that are going on in this verse. The first thing you will see in verse, you know, in verse number 12 is that there was this particular vow to kill Paul the apostle by a particular group of people. Verse number 12 says, And when the day it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying, They will neither eat nor drink till they have killed Paul. So that's the first thing you see in this particular chapter 23. There but there was a vow to kill Paul. The second thing you see was a conspiracy involving the chief priest and the elder. In other words, when you cannot get somebody, you have to make a plan to get him in a different way. And they now had there was a conspiracy. These people who have made a vow that they want to kill Paul, they had to get the approval of the council, the approval of the high priest and the elder. And the Bible tells us in verse number 13 that 40 of those conspirators went to these guys. These were supposed to be holy men. These were supposed to be preserving the word of God. And yet they have no problem killing somebody. That's another story for another day. So you see the first one, they vowed to kill Paul. The second one is a conspiracy involving the chief priests and the elders. Number three was a Paul. It was a plot to carry out that conspiracy. It was not just a discussion. They had a plan. And that plan was that you invite Paul as if you want to interrogate him. Invite him as if you want to get more evidence. Invite him as if you are interested in learning more about his own defense. And before he gets there, you take care of him. And you see that every day happening. Most of the people who oppose the Christian faith is not because they are interested in what they want to hear. It's not because they are interested in the word of God. The word of God has been in circulation for over 2,000 years now. So it's not that we are saying anything new that they, are, that they are hearing about for the first time. But the interesting thing is that they have another agenda. And these guys have another agenda. Their conspiracy was to bring Paul in so that we can kill him before he gets to make his defense. And then number four, you see the foiling of, the, of that particular plan. If you read from verse number 16, which is not get to in our reading, but in number verse number 16, the Bible, so, the Bible said, So when Paul's sister's son heard of their ambush, he went and entered the barrack and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurion to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. And so in verse number 18, the Bible tells us, He took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. In other words, when they were doing the plan, as they were doing the plan to kill Paul the apostle, as all these 40 men who have bound themselves with an oath went to the high priest and the elder and they were telling them this is what we want to do. There was somebody that God has planted there who happened to be the nephew of Paul. Okay? And he was listening to all this thing. As soon as they heard all the stories, they said, okay, Today is not the day you are going to kill my uncle. So he went to the prison and told him. But Paul now told him, say, okay, what you are supposed to do is don't tell me. Tell the guy that has the ability to do something about it. And then the fifth thing you see from the chapter, from the, in chapter 23, is in verse number 23, the Bible tells us of the transporting of Paul to safety. The transporting of Paul to safety under the, under the authority of Philip. Sorry, of Felix, who was the who was the governor in Caesarea. If you read verse number twenty-three, the Bible says, "And they called for two centurions, saying, Prepare two hundred soldiers, to a seventy horsemen, and two hundred spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night, and provide um, and provide mounts for Paul on for, uh, for uh, and provide mount to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor." So you see from these verses of the scripture. Right from the beginning, you start reading from uh, chapter 23. There was this first thing. There was this first thing you see, and that was the vow to kill Paul. And then you see the conspiracy of the, of the high priest. And then you see the, uh, the plot, the plan to carry out that conspiracy, the foiling of that particular plan, and the transporting of Paul to safety. These ones were already, a, you know, there are already enough plots to make for a very interesting uh, movie about the deliverance of Paul, you know. And to the casual reader, it is very, very easy to be caught up in this particular plot. I mean, just looking at the idea that they want to kill Paul, that's enough to create a Bible study of his own. For anyone who is just casually reading this chapter of the verse of the scripture, it is very easy for you to focus your attention on the conspiracy that the elder, that the chief priests and the elders were involved in. It's very easy for you to look at the fact that you say, okay, God actually planted the boy there to hear the conspiracy so that Paul can be delivered. It is also very easy for us to focus on the idea that yes, Paul was transported into safety, but that's not where we're going this very evening. As you probably must have guessed. Because it won't be the Bible study 
if you go straight to the point, you know? Anyway, but that's not where we're going. What we are going actually is a very obscure verse of the scripture in this same chapter 23. There's a little verse there that I read earlier on that in most cases you will easily lose, you will lose sight of. And that if you open your Bible back to the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 23, I want you to now go back to verse number 11. Go back to verse number 11. The Bible tells us in verse number 11, it said, but, for, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Okay? Just like you have testified of me here at Jerusalem. Just like you have told the whole people why you believe what you believe and how you came to believe what you believe. He said you are going to do exactly the same thing in Rome. So, Paul was, you know, God Almighty came in a revelation. Gave Paul the apostle. So when these people were doing their own plan, God already has his own agenda. When they were vowing to kill Paul, God already had his own agenda. When the chief priest was conspiring and doing what he was doing, God already had his own agenda. When they were crafting the, uh, crafting the plan that they were going to accost Peter, uh, Paul and kill him before he gets to the council, God already had his own plan. When they were looking at all the things that they were looking at, God already had his own plan. And the verse of the scripture tells us, number one, God told Paul three basic things in that verse of the scripture. The first one was that God was saying, regardless of what the devil is doing, I am giving you assurance of divine protection. He said, the Lord stood by him at night and said, be of good cheer. None of all my friends, relax. Let these guys exhaust themselves. I am giving you assurance of protection. Number two, from that verse of the scripture, you will see God was giving Paul the apostle an assurance of ministry continuity. In other words, this is not the end of the story. The fact that you are locked up in in Jerusalem right now, that's not the end of the story. I am giving you an assurance that what you have done here in Jerusalem, you are going to do it in Rome. So number one, there was assurance of divine protection. Number two, there was assurance of ministry continuity. And then number three, there was the certainty of preaching in Rome. In other words, I am going to use you to be able to reach the place where you don't want to know, where you don't even know you are going to get to. So God already, in that little verse of the scripture, has already given Paul the apostle the future, his future in ministry. He thought he was going to be running up and down the whole of Asia, jumping from one ship to the other, visiting one city from the other. But the Lord is saying, no, I'm going to incarcerate you and then take you from that incarceration and take you to where you need to go. Even when all the plans were going on, even when the high priest thought they had all they were doing, the Lord Almighty had a different plan. The question is, why was the Lord doing this? Why did the Lord give him that, put that verse number 11? In that chapter 23. Why did they put it there? The first thing is that the Lord was giving the assurance of protection to Paul during his time in prison. Because God was saying, nothing will happen to you and nobody is going to hurt you because my agenda is what stands. Regardless of what you are thinking. Regardless of the plan that people are putting together. The Bible said the counsel of the Almighty God is what stands. So regardless of what's going on in your own life. Regardless of what the doctors are saying or the, or the economy is saying and all the other good things that are happening around you, whatever the Lord has spoken concerning you this year, that is what stands. It doesn't matter who, what else anybody is, what another person is saying. And that's why the Lord Almighty was telling Paul the apostle. That's why he appeared before him. That's why he stood before him. And he told him, I'm giving you the assurance of protection because regardless of what the plan are, nobody will be able to change what I have said concerning you. Number two, why did the Lord tell Paul the apostle? The Lord told him the Lord was giving Paul the apostle the assurance of continuity of Paul's ministry because God was saying, I am not done with you. Your ministry is not over just because you are in prison. Just because you have been locked up doesn't mean that I have finished what I, the assignment that I've given unto you. So regardless of what is going on in your own life also, regardless of the challenge, the job might not be what it is. The family might not be the way you, way you expect it to be. Your health might not be exactly what you want it to be. But the Lord is saying, I'm giving you the assurance of ministry continuity. Because the fact that you are where you are today does not mean that's the end of the story. There's continuity. The Lord God Almighty will still do what he wants to do with you. I am not done with you. That's what he told Paul. And that is what he's telling some of us here this morning, this evening. Number three, the Lord was talking to Paul the Apostle about the, about the certainty of preaching in Rome. Because he was telling Paul, this is your next phase. This is the next phase of your ministry. 
You have been traveling from Galatia to the Thessalonica to all the other places. You've been jumping from one place to the other. He's saying your next phase of ministry is going to be in Rome. And how you are going to get there, you don't know. But I've already prepared a plan for you. And that plan will mean that you are going to go on first class treatment via as a prisoner. And he got there. There's a certainty of him preaching in Rome. The Lord told him because that is the next phase of his ministry. God is saying to Paul, the next phase of your ministry has just begun. You are going to witness in Rome. And whatever you are going through right now, the Lord is saying this is your next phase in your journey. Whatever you have experienced in the years past, whatever condition that you have seen in the last part, whatever disappointment that you have gone through, whatever incarceration that you are currently suffering, the Lord is saying I'm using it as a launch pad for you to get to a place where you have never been before. And that is what is telling Paul the Apostle. I'm going to take you to Rome. I'm going to give you access to places. By the time you start reading, if you read chapter 24, 25, you will see Paul now started speaking, not just to commoners anymore. He started speaking to governors. He started speaking to rulers. He started speaking to emperor. He had access to people he would ordinarily not have access to because the Lord is saying, I'm launching you into a new phase of your ministry. That's what the Lord is saying to him there. The importance of verse number 11 in the chapter 10, chapter 23, it is important because, number one, the Lord Almighty stood by him. The Lord Almighty said, don't be, be of good cheer. What you did in Jerusalem, you are, going to do in, you are going to do in Rome. Why is it important for Paul to hear this message? But it is important for Paul to hear this message because it gives Paul confidence. It gives him confidence. No matter the plot of the devil, no matter the strategy of hell, no matter what the enemy is putting in place, you have the confidence because God says, what you did here, you are going to do over there. And when the Lord God Almighty opens and He gives you an encounter, when you have that kind of revelation from the Almighty God, He gives you that particular confidence that regardless of what is happening in my situation right now, regardless of the condition that I'm facing right now, regardless of the bank account balance, regardless of the condition of the pantry, regardless of the condition of the test that I've just received from the doctor, the confidence comes that God will do what He said He's going to do in your life. That is what happened to Paul the Apostle. You are in jail right now. You have testified in Jerusalem. But I can assure you, this same testimony is going to be heard in Rome. Between Jerusalem and Rome, a lot of funky things are going to happen. But you can be sure that you are going to get to Rome. That's what the Lord is saying to you. Regardless of what you are going to face it. Regardless of the challenges that you are going through. Regardless of all the, all the mumbling and all the mumbling that people are saying about you, about your family, about the church. The Lord is saying, the vision that I've given unto you, the revelation that I've given unto you, my plan for you, the things, the place that I'm taking you, it will happen. Regardless of whatever is going on. So that is why verse number 11 was very, very important in the life of Paul. Very important because number one, it gave Paul confidence. It's important because it gave Paul the assurance. Bible makes us understand, you know, it made Paul to understand that until his assignment is fulfilled, the protection of the Lord is sure. If you read chapter 27 of Acts of the Apostle, the same revelation was given to Paul again, but a different one. Acts of the Apostles chapter 27, if you read from verse 23, the Bible tells us there. It says, for there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and of whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted unto me those who sail with thee. Therefore, take heart, men. For I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. In other words... Paul was not going to die before he gets to Jerusalem, before he gets to Rome. He knew that because the Lord told him. He told him in chapter 23, verse, uh, verse 11. Now he's repeating it again in chapter 27, verse 23. He said, the angel of the Lord stood by me. He told me that where I am going, I am going to get there. I am going to give my testimony to Caesar. He said, so forget about dying. I'm not going to die. That's why Jesus Christ, when there was that particular wave, when the storm was brewing and everybody was panicking, the Bible said Jesus was in the, on a pillow asleep because Jesus Christ knew he wasn't going to die in a storm. He knew that. He knew that the only way he was going to leave the earth was going to be crucified. He didn't like it, but that's a story for another day. But he knew he wasn't going to die in the storm. And because he knew he wasn't going to die in the storm, why worry? The same thing here. Because the Lord has already told you. And the same thing for you. Whatever the Lord has spoken. That's why the Bible tells the book of Numbers. He said God is not a man that he should lie. Or the son of man that he should repent. Whatever he has said concerning you. Whatever he has said concerning your family. Whatever he has said concerning the church. He will fulfill it. 
And that is why we spend the time at the end of every year to first of all hear the voice of the Almighty God. Where are you taking us? So that as we walk, we can walk with, we can walk like Paul. We can walk in confidence, number one. Number two, we can walk in assurance. Number three, we can walk in encouragement because situations will happen. Life is going to happen to us. Things may not go the way we want it to go. There's going to be disappointment. There are times when things will, when life will bring its own challenges. But as long as you have that revelation of what the Lord has spoken concerning you, as long as you have that particular anchor upon which you can hang your life and say, this is the word of the Almighty God for me, you have that encouragement that nothing will happen, nothing will go wrong, except for the word of God will be fulfilled in my life. That was why that, uh, that verse of the scripture was important to Paul the Apostle. Number four, the verse was important to Paul the Apostle because he kept him focused. He kept him focused. He gave Paul the ability to be able to stay on track. The Lord told him, the only reason why you are alive is because what you said in Jerusalem, you are going to say it in Rome. So if anything is happening to you, keep it in mind. If, any, if there's a storm going on, just keep it in mind. The only reason why you are going to Rome is to give your testimony. And the same thing. Regardless of what's going on in your life, if you hear the word of the Almighty God, if you receive the assurance from heaven, regardless of what is happening at the place of war, regardless of what's happening with your husband, with your wife, with your friend, or with the people in your life, you will find out that it helps you to stay focused because you say, this is what the Lord told me. This is what the Lord told me. Not only that, verse number 11 is very important to Paul because it gave him boldness. Gave him boldness because he knew if the Lord wanted me to say this, then I'm going to say it in a way that you will never forget it. If you get to chapter 24, 25, the Bible says that that particular fe uh, fe Felix, uh, uh, fe uh, uh, is it Felix or Philip, or one of them, one of those emperors came to him, and Paul preached and preached and preached, and the man says, Paul, apostle, too much learning has made you mad. He said, you almost made me to be a Christian. In other words, that man gave a passionate defense. So, the, because the Almighty God already told him he was going to give that same testimony, he gave Paul the boldness. And not only that, he gave him peace of mind. Because he knew nothing was going to happen to him. This thing, I mean, I'm going to Rome. You may not believe me. You can do all your plan. You can fast for as many days as you want to fast. You can decide not to eat and say you want to kill me. You are wasting your time because God says I'm going to Rome. The same thing. You can decide to hate lifelong anointing church. It doesn't make any difference. This is just the beginning. We are going to have many more buildings. You can decide to hate us and say, okay, you don't like our faith, but we are moving forward. What the Lord has spoken concerning us will come to pass. It doesn't matter what you think about it. That is what gives you peace of mind. When people look at you and they think that you're not know, you don't know what you're doing, or you're do, you are, you are just wasting your time doing what you're doing, you have that peace of mind because why? The Lord has stood by your right side and he told you, be of good cheer. The testimony you shared in Jerusalem, you will share in Rome. That is the assurance that you have. And then finally it gives you joy. Because you know that you are in the center of the will of God. You know that you are doing what he wants you to do. And because you know what he is doing, you are doing what he wants you to do, he know, you know that he's going to keep you and preserve you. So that's what verse number 11 tells us. If you are going to sum up verse number 11, you are going to sum it up in such a way. It's saying that in times of trouble, in times of difficulty, you need your moment of encounter with the Almighty God. In times when everything doesn't make sense, in times when your loyal friends, the people who used to support you, are not planning for your death, in times when people are fasting and they are saying that they want to destroy you, in times when promotion looks elusive, in times when marriage looks upside down, in times when finances does not appear the way it's supposed to be, you need a moment when God will stand by your side. You need that moment. Okay? The Bible tells us in that uh, Acts of the Apostles 23 by 11, he said, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so must you also bear witness of me at Rome. The question is, why do you need this kind of encounter? Why do you need this kind of a revelation? Why do you need God to stand by your side when things are going upside down? Why do you need it? My brothers and sisters, I'll tell you this, that you need it, number one, because life will happen to you sooner or later. You may not be encuffed. You may not be incarcerated like Paul the Apostle, but life is going to throw you a curveball. Challenges will come. The people you trust will disappoint you. There will be moments when you will be alone. In all those times, you will need an encounter with the Almighty God because your moment of encounter is what gives you your strength and your confidence. 
When the Lord Almighty reveals to you and tells you, don't be afraid. Keep doing what you're doing. I am with you. That particular revelation away has a way of changing everything. It has a way of, me, of clearing the mist out of the way. It has a way of giving you a vision that is, that is 2020. It has a way of making sense out of life. It has a way of encouraging you. That revelation has a way of keeping you focused. It has a way of giving you boldness to continue to move forward. It has a way of giving you peace of mind. When you hear, when the Lord tells you, this is what I have given unto you. If the Lord Almighty gives you that revelation and you see it very, very clearly, it turns everything around. That is the same kind of revelation that Isaac got. The Bible says that in the time of famine, Isaac took that seed that he could have prepared for his own family and he started sticking them inside the ground. Started sticking them inside the ground. Only a complete moron will do that in the time of famine. But Isaac heard the word of the Almighty God that if you sow, you will reap. So the point I'm trying to make here this very evening is this. Until your moment of encounter is what gives you that satisfaction that you are in line with the word of God. But if you don't have that encounter, my brothers and sisters, if you don't have that encounter, if you don't know how to cultivate that moment where you can hear the voice of the almighty God, I tell you, my brothers and sisters, your, your journey will be filled with uncertainty. If you don't know how to receive that encounter. If you don't know how to position yourself for that encounter, if you don't know how to cultivate the presence of the Almighty God, your journey will be filled with uncertainty this year. If you don't know how to cultivate His presence, there will be a lot of questions that you will not find answers to. There will be a lot of doubt and insecurity because there is a lot of shifting things going on around us right now. Nobody knew. Nobody knows what tomorrow will hold. And because you don't know what tomorrow holds, that's why you need the voice of the one who created tomorrow. That's why you need the voice of the one who knows the end from the very beginning. If you do not know how to cultivate the presence of the Almighty God in this new year, if you cannot say like Paul the Apostle that he has so an angel of the Almighty God stood by me and he told me that I'm going to get to Rome, if you don't know how to cultivate that presence, I tell you it will be very difficult for you to run this particular race to the finish line. Very difficult. Because so many things will come your way that will want to pull you out of the way. The question this evening is how do you cultivate the presence of the Almighty God? How do you get to the point where you can enjoy fellowship with Him? How do you get to the point where you can hear His voice in difficult times? How do you get to the very point where you can say, Yes, I know the Lord told me this. This is what He said. How do you get to that point? James chapter 4. Reading from verse number 7, the Bible tells us, Therefore, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. How do you cultivate the presence of the Almighty God? Number one, you cultivate the presence of the Almighty God by drawing near to him. How do you draw near to him? You draw near to him in your prayer. You draw near to him in the study of the word of God. You draw near to him in the meditation of the word of God. You draw near to him by spending time in his presence. That is how you begin to draw to the, near to the almighty God. And when you are drawing near to the almighty God, you cleanse yourself. The Bible said the eyes of the almighty God is so pure that he cannot behold iniquity. In other words, you cannot walk into his presence with a lot of garbage hanging behind you. And that's why anytime we pray, we say, Lord, purge us and cleanse us. Not because you are actively committing sin, but because you are saying, whatever will stand in the way, whatever will not allow you to enjoy fellowship with him, whatever will not allow the almighty God to draw near unto you, you want it out of the way. That is how you cultivate his presence. When you recognize that the eyes of the almighty God is so pure, and that you cannot come into his presence with any fields. Number three, how do you cultivate his presence? You cultivate his presence when you purify your hearts, and you live a life that is holy. Purification of heart does not mean that you do not have, you know, it does not mean that you do not have straight thoughts. You are a human being. And as long as you live here, you are going to have all sorts of things running through your mind. 
But the idea is the Bible says you take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What that simply means is that when that thought comes into your mind and you filter it through the word of God and it does not align, you discard it. You do not ruminate. You do not spend time. You do not continue to dwell on any thought that does not bring God the glory. Because if you do that, you open the door. But as soon as you begin to eliminate all those thoughts, a time will come that your mind heart will be so used to, to follow it, to, 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 to depend on what to, to kind of a filtering filth from your mind that your mind will not begin to use to getting things that are good from the Almighty God. The Lord is saying that anyone who wants to cultivate His presence must maintain the purity of hearts. A purity of heart, a purity of thoughts. That's why David said, Create in me a new heart and renew a right spirit within me. Say, Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Take not your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Just renew a right spirit within me. That's how you draw near to him. He said, then reverence his presence. Look at verse number nine. He said, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. In other words, God is not saying you should go around as a sad person. He just make sure you respect my presence. Honor my presence. Reverence my presence. Don't come and treat my things anyhow. And that's why he said the name of the Almighty God. The very first commandment is say, honor the name of the Almighty God. Do not do, don't just take the name of the Almighty God in vain. Give him respect, give him honor. And then finally say, humble yourself in his presence. The humility is to say that, Lord, I don't know everything, I'm limited. The humility is to say, Lord God Almighty, I do not have the ability to do the things that you are asking me to do. In my own power, in my own wish, in my own understanding, I am limited. With my own connection, I can't be able to make this thing. That's why I depend on you. That is how you draw into the presence of the Almighty God. When you show that you are not sufficient, when you show that you cannot do it on your own, when you show that you are limited in your own capacity, your own ability, what happens is that you unleash, you allow God to unleash His power through you. When you make yourself available to the Almighty God, you draw down to Him, you pour your way, you cleanse yourself, you maintain a prayer heart, and you are humble in His presence, you find that the Lord Almighty begins to move closer to you. That's why Isaiah says that it's not that the eyes of it's not that God's eye is blind, it's not that his ears are blocked, it's not that his hands have become kuturu. No, he's only saying that the Lord God Almighty wants you to draw near. When you take away all those fields, then he can pull you closer to himself. And that is what you need to be able to navigate this new year. You need the presence of the Almighty God. Paul the Apostle would not have been able to survive the harsh condition that he was subjected to if he had not received that revelation. If he had not received the assurance from the Almighty God that God was going to keep him. If God has not given me that assurance that yet nothing will happen unto him until he testified before Caesar in Rome. A lot of things would have gone on the other, would have gone sideways. But Paul had that confidence to continue to run the race because he received that assurance. The question this very evening is this. Do you have an assurance for how this year is going to turn out for you? Have you received the word for yourself? Have you received the word for your life? Have you received the word for your family? Have you received the word for your career? A word for concerning the work of your hand? Concerning the things that you are involved in? Have you heard from the Almighty God concerning this year? Because if you have not, the chances that you're going to run some circles around yourself becomes higher. But when you hear the word of the Almighty God telling you this is what I want to do for you, or this is where I'm taking you, it gives you confidence. Bible tells us that he said he he it's in, in resting, you know, in quietness and in resting. He said that would be your strength. In other words, you need to be able to just first of all do the first thing. What is the Lord taking me? Where does he want me to go? And you can only get that when you cultivate his presence. This evening I want you to talk to the Almighty God. Am I ready to cultivate his presence? Do I even want to cultivate his presence? Open your mouth and just talk to the Almighty God.